having a snowy mountain peak in the background is something that almost everyone who, who creates digital environments will come across every now and again. Um, often it is a great um, set piece to show just how large the scale of something is or often it'll be like the big pinnacle that uh, you know is part of the story and you have to create basically a, a, a somewhat lone mountain peak. One of the problems is mountain peaks are rarely just lone. Um, we have great examples like Mount Fuji or Kilimanjaro but again Normally, mountains tend to be part of a larger system. And sometimes, even when they're not, you do want to portray them a bit better than just a single lone hero mountain because certain types of erosion and other um, things that people want to show, like making your mountain look utterly epic with all these rugged features, well, they tend not to happen that often when they're just by themselves. That's why the most impressive mountains are found on some of the most dangerous mountain um, uh, mountain chains. And, um, you know, it, it's not always just visible everywhere. Anyways, that's beside the point. The point is, if you want to create a realistic um, uh, a hero mountain, it's better when it's part of a, a slightly larger ecosystem for many reasons. One, as I was just rambling on about, it's more realistic. The second is then it gives you a few more options for composition as well because that way you don't have to worry about just a single mountain. And the third is, maybe in some ways the most important one, is scale. Scale is easier to show when you have reference points in between the the final object and where you are. And you have to do, and uh, you have to create like many, many layers to have an impressive mountain look really impressive without just stretching it vertically and that's another thing don't ever do that don't ever 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 do that if your mountain doesn't look realistic and majestic with 2500 meters it is not going to look more majestic just because you raise it to 6000 meters but anyways that's beside the point again so going back you want to have a scale of uh, reference and instead of you know forcing a a lion or a person or something in the frame just by having great reference points in between just naturally will help convey the scale like here you see the immediate foreground and then a bit beyond and a bit beyond and a bit beyond and it's kind of like in real life where your eye just starts looking up towards the mountain and you realize just how huge it is is we want to replicate that sense of scale and epicness without resorting to cheesy uh, hacks and shortcuts so to do that we're first going to use a few cheesy hacks and shortcuts but they're not about um, the outcome they're more about the construction and the way we start is like always with a mountain so I'm just gonna zoom out a bit and it's a typical mountain I when I created this I really did not care what shape it was um, I think I played with the seed a little bit to get this. It's fine. It's, it's again, doesn't need to be that impressive. Then it was displaced just to add a little bit of breaking to the pattern. Uh, and then eroded so that it looks nice and mountainy. Then bash it together with a crater. So I just created a simple impact crater. Again, just defaults mostly. And then you combine it and you get this weird looking thing. Now this is as far as it gets from our um, actual hero mountain, but there's a reason for this. So this is what will create part of the structure. The rest of the structure is actually provided by a slope noise. So here is slope noise. Again, I'm just uh, using the defaults here. But then, um, oh, I have clamped it down though. I uh, forgot to mention that. So this is clamped down, so it's not too tall. Um, and then if we go to the combine, I'm using max uh, combination method. Um, the ratio is 80%. Again, that's not a rule of thumb. You'll just have to judge based on your shapes and your seeds. But this is what we have created. And this is important because we want the hero image, or sorry, the hero mountain to have... Uh, 
you know, kind of like a, a neighborhood of mountainy things. And so because erosion, by definition, works with taking things away, you first have to bulk up your terrain quite a bit. And then the rest can be done through erosion later and it starts forming it into a mountain. Um, the erosion node, anything you give it, it will eventually try to turn it into a pointy mountain given enough strength and duration. So if that's what it's going to do, we need to give it a lot more bulk to shave off of the, the shape. And so that's why we create this. Now, once this essential shape is created, we need a lot more um, things for it to erode through. And by through, I mean obstacles through which sand should flow, other things that should break, etc. And so for that, I've added a fold node to this. So that's taking our basic structure and adding all sorts of interesting detail. So first of all, you'll see we're getting our mountain peak here. And we're getting beautiful strata everywhere, lots of nice long striations. There's some very interesting uh, cutouts going on here. So overall, it's just made our terrain look a lot more rugged. Then we take the fold and we do two types of terracing. First, we do this, which is just, you know, almost, again, almost default. Uh, but our focus here is we need a long uh, gaps between the terraces. So we just have 10 and you can see how it's creating a terrace here and here and here and here. So it's just creating different vertical levels for our terrain. The second one though, it's creating lots of it. I just maxed out the terraces and minimize the uniformity so they're just happening all over the place. And so it's creating this structure, which in some ways mimics what the original strata, uh, or the stratification from folding did, but then it forces it more onto the horizontal level. Now I've used residual process here, and, uh, here as well, and that's what creates certain outcrops that don't fit into the normal um, staircase-like pattern that uh, Terrace creates. Anyways, we take those two and we combine them equally, just using blend 50%, so we get a bit of both. And that's just to add uh, a little extra level of detail uh, for the erosion to feed on. So when we have these um, the thin and thick stratas, the, uh, the erosion has to break through that and it'll end up creating lots of broken little tiny shelves. And these shelves are where we will uh, get to put a lot of snow. So to create that, we must first create all these um, uh, stratified lines so that erosion can, can break them. And then that's where now the erosion comes in. So we're doing it in two pieces. So the first is a pretty much a default um, erosion. The only thing higher is the duration. So at 14%, you can see it's now eroding the heck out of this terrain. Uh, and because of the shape of the crater, so this is important. So I'm gonna go back to this. So you can see this is lower than the rest. And that means this will break much more easily than this, especially because this is where the, the sediment and the force of the sediment will flow. Um, so again, if you think of erosion like water, it helps you visualize a lot better what will happen before it happens. And so with the erosion applied, so okay, you can see it broke through all the stresses coming down here. It broke through, creating this nice curve almost. There's another river system here and we get to retain our main mountain peak. And now when I go down here, you can see that gives me a fantastic vantage point. Um, it kind of like gives me really nice uh, composition in of itself because of the way the rest of the mountain is structured. And because we're looking uphill, it creates a much better sense of scale than if you were to do this on a flat surface. Now, that's just the one erosion node. Uh, so the second one, this one is actually specifically aimed at carving out the river system, but making it more uh, aggressively eroded. So what I've done is 
you can see the slightly um, uh, transparent sliders, those are default settings. The bright ones like these are have been changed. So what I've changed is um, I've increased down cutting to 100%, which means the, the erosion force goes vertically inside the train more. Inhibition is zero, which means that process, the down cutting process is not inhibited. So it's not creating extra sedimentation. It's just creating these nice deep grooves um, that kind of press into the surface and then press forward, creating these, these amazing flow structures. And then lastly, because this is so intense and it's so strong, you don't want it happening everywhere because that will ruin your um, mountain. So what I've done is I've chosen selective processes, uh, selective processing, and the area effect is set to precipitation amount, which means um, whatever the masked area is, that's the only place that receives rainfall. Even the rest of the terrain does get eroded. So I've used slope as the bias type. So it's now creating an internal slope mask. And so anything that's over 89% um, steepness uh, will uh, uh, will get rainfall. So these steeper uh, areas will get more rainfall than something flat down here. And so these sides will get more rainfall than the flatter bits, uh, even if they're at the top. And so with that set, what happens is we get all this strong rainfall uh, precipitation happening, and then that creates this structure. So I'm gonna go back to the previous erosion nodes so you can compare. So this is without the slope biased um, erosion. This is with the slope biased. And because uh, it's uh, it's happening with a lot of down cutting and zero inhibition, it's now starting to also go through, like the material that comes out from here, goes through this, spreads it out, and it takes away some of the the flatter areas created with the previous erosion. Now, I always like to use at least two or more um, uh, erosion nodes. Um, I try not to get everything done in just one erosion node because that way you end up with something that looks very simplistic and can sometimes also look a bit CG if not done right. So if you have one more erosion on top of the previous erosion, give it a little bit of a, um, a variation like we did here where the second one just affects the down cutting, that can help create a more um, a, a vivid look for your terrain and make it look a lot less CG. So anyways, this is kind of all that we have to do to create our hero mountain. So this is ready. All we have to do is create texture and dump some snow. So let's go and look at what the snow looks like. So this is the first um, snowfall. Uh, in previous versions, this was called a snow node. There's nothing new about it. We're just calling it snowfall. Uh, now I'm going to turn on the 2D view so you can see where the uh, all the snow is. So right click and select snow. Okay, so this is where all the snow was dumped. And let's see what's controlling it. I have very little duration, just 5%, but a lot of intensity. That means, uh, uh, you know, more um, a snow is created and dumped onto the onto the surface. Now I have a snow line at 21%. So um, at the 21% height mark, like somewhere here probably, that's where the snowfall stops. And so what that does is it gives us a chance to have the snow settle and flow down. And to do that, we take advantage of the snow line as well as the settle and thaw slider, which I've also plugged to um, 100%. So that means lots of snow falls, then it starts going down the slopes a bit. Now, we are uh, using a little less adhered snow mass here as well. So what that means is when this number is low, less snow sticks to the uh, mountain and uh, flows more freely. If this goes high, then the snow is less likely to flow down and will more uh, uh, will be more likely to clump together up on the mountain tops. Now we wanted the snow to flow down, and so that's why I've reduced the adhered snow mass level. And like with erosion, I'm not stopping with just one snow node. So we're going to um, a second snowfall. 
And this one, you can see, is more focused on creating a lot of snow that will flow down the rivers. And so to do that, again, um, somewhat high intensity, but not as high as before. Same for the settle and thaw. I also added a lot of melt, and that's so that uh, a snow that's deposited everywhere, and in this case, I do mean everywhere because we don't have a snow line. So all of that melts and starts pulling together and pooling together uh, and into uh, creating this, uh, uh, this uh, snowy river. Now in this, I've reduced the adhered snow mass even further, as well as the slip off angle. The slip off angle is when the snow reaches a particular tipping point uh, a tipping angle when it will stop clumping together and start falling down and slipping on the slopes. So with both of these settings so low, we are now encouraging the, the snow to flow down a lot. Now what I've done is I've chained the two snow uh, nodes together, so they're going one to the other, and I'm taking the output from both of them and combining it using 100% max, so that and then using a quick color to turn that mask into a snow color that we can use further down the line. So I'm not gonna color them separately. That doesn't really make any sense. So I just combined the snow mask output from both of those uh, snow nodes and they're gonna now go uh, and stay here until we need them. Okay, so that's pretty much take, uh, taken care of the, the, the snow and uh, the rest of the geometry generation. Now let's look at the color generation. This is actually going to be very simple. Um, I've just applied a texture node, so it's creating this mask uh, from our terrain, and I'm taking that and putting it to, to a sat maps node. Sat map no, uh, sat maps node also um, just shows a good uh, 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 color uh, satellite map from the library, and really haven't touched anything else. We're focusing on the snow. We're going to have dramatic lighting, so. I'm not too worried about like uh, uh, punching in a lot of detail into the texture. Uh, in fact, that would probably start making it look less realistic. So I've just gone for something very simple. And then that gets mixed with the snow that we created before. And then finally, um, what I wanted was a bit of like a, a, a sprinkling of snow. And you can do that with the, um, the, the snow node, and that would require a bit of trial and error, and you have to get the melt right, and the slip-off angle has to be really high, and so on. But because what I wanted was very superficial and something just for the, uh, the, the texture portion rather than the actual geometry portion, I just did a little um, sheet and used a vegetation node. So the vegetation node is built to create green dots uh, that represent vegetation but you can supply a custom um, color to this instead of using the gradient and so what i did was uh okay there you can see all the little dots that the vegetation node is creating so i have really low occurrence so i don't want it happening everywhere but i do want a bit of density where it does occur and then lots of chaos um, nothing at the bottom just at the top, and I wanted to avoid extreme, um, uh, either really flat or really steep areas. Now, normally this would be uh, something that's green, like I said. So what I've done is I've created a constant color, just a white color that I'm plugging into the override port for the vegetation, and then that gives us this little bit of um, extra sprinkling of snow. And it's pretty easy. I could just go and um, increase the the slider for slope top, and you can see we get um, more sprinkled snow everywhere. Now that more or less completes our terrain, but there's one more step I want to add. So when we go to the snow, I'm gonna turn off the 2D preview because I really want you to see what's happening here. So snow by default because we're looking at something that's really large in scale we're not we're not up there in the snow we're looking at this from a very uh, big distance there is no detail in the snow 
But if you want to add a bit of detail to the snow and have it be more flow-based rather than just a simple noise that you add on top, here's a little trick you can use. So what I do is I actually use alluvium node and I change it to the deposits mode. And so that starts creating lots of sand deposits that flow down. And so that's exactly what I'm doing here. If you see my flow setting is high and the chaos setting is high. So that creates a lot of um, unstructured um, sediment flow. And so it gives us this. Now that will overpower the terrain at some point. And so what I've done is I've masked it to the snow output from the first snow node. And so that way it gives a bit of bulk just to the snow area. It creates a little crinkly pattern that can be useful sometimes. And when you have long slopes, it can start creating interesting effects. Um, so that's it. It's something, it's an extra step. You can use it or not. Either way, it's fine. So I'll open the viewport settings and let's get a really dramatic uh, light setup going. Pull the sun towards the horizon and I think we have a bit too much of the sprinkled snow so I'll go back to what I had before and there you go you have a, a really nice hero mountain setup you can take this to your scene just you know add a ca castle up here maybe a few flying dragons or um, you can set up a whole scene down here and have this be up there. I'm just gonna play with the sun angle because this looks fun. I like these um, these shadows that come in over the other um, like the pieces of the mountain here. It just the, these shadows I find they give a, a nicer sense of grandness because it makes it feel like uh, you know you're in a larger world. And so there you have it. Um, hope this technique is useful for you for creating some pretty cool mountains.